All right. If you have your Bible this morning, let's turn to Colossians chapter 1. Uh, last week, we started talking about inheritance, uh, the kingdom of God inheritance. All right. We are going to have to understand and get our minds wrapped around that we have already been given an inheritance. It's not something that we have to wait for. It's not something that we have to be good enough for. It's something that Jesus already provided for us and it belongs to you. Now, what you're going to have to do is receive it and take possession of it through and by your faith. All right. There's an enemy out there who's fighting to keep you out of that inheritance. You know, just like in the natural, you can receive an inheritance, but then you got to go to court for the next 15,000 years because somebody's trying to fight you over it. Well, I'm telling you right now, in the, in, in, in the, realm, of the, in the realm of the spirit, there's a, there's, a, there's a devil who's fighting you to keep you out of your inheritance. But the good thing about it, our advocate is much stronger than he is. And if we we'll listen to our advocate and follow his instructions, we can begin to partake of what already belongs to us. Amen. Now, let's let's look at this. Colossians chapter one, verse nine again. For this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Notice, be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Why? So that you can walk worthy or live and conduct your life in a manner that pleases God. Well, why do I need to do that? So that you can be fruitful in every good work while you increase in the knowledge of God. And while you be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto patience and long suffering with joyfulness. And there should always be a giving of thanks in your heart unto the Father. Why? Because he has made you meet that word meet there is able. Able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Whom he whom God has delivered us from the power and the authority of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. Now, we looked at this word last week, translated, and we said the word translated means to change our nature, form and condition. So it says here that God, through the work that he done through Jesus, has, number one, delivered us from the power, or another word would be, the authority of darkness. So Satan no longer has authority in your life. You've been delivered from there. Stop being afraid of what the devil can do, because he can't do much. So you've been delivered from the authority and the power of darkness, and you've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. The work that God did in Christ changed your nature and your condition. I don't care what you look like right now. That is not your final condition if you will continue to move by faith. All right. So he's either either we believe that or we don't. So the word translated means to, like once again, to change your form, condition, and nature. Well, we know that God has done that. Now, how are we going to benefit from this translation that's gone on? Well, look back up in verse 15. Giving thanks unto the Father, who has made us able to be partakers. So it says the Father makes you able to partake of your inheritance. So that means he expects you to, to, partake, to enjoy it. If I give, if I cook dinner and invite you over and says partake, I expect you to do what? Eat. You don't get invited somewhere and they say partake and then you're still wondering if you can eat or not. No, if they say, hey, I'll invite you over, enjoy, that means I've called you to the table to partake of whatever's on the table. You don't come over, you can have some of that, some of that, but you don't get any of this over here. No, that's not, that's not what, 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 what the invitation means. So it says that the father 
has made you and I able. So that means every one of you sitting in this room this morning, you have the ability on the inside of you to partake of the inheritance that's been provided. Now, how do you do it? He said he's made you able to be partaker of the inheritance of the saints in light. That word light there is referring to God, and in particular, it's referring to God's revelation. Being filled with the knowledge of his will, having revelation knowledge on how to partake of the inheritance. So you're not going to be able to walk in the fullness of your inheritance without revelation from God. He's going to have to show you how to do it. Because you are not going to walk in the inheritance of the kingdom of God with natural wisdom. This is why it says that you need to be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Because natural wisdom can only take you so far. But to walk in what Jesus has provided, you're going to need God's enlightenment. You can't get there any other way. So what I want to talk to you this morning about is the revelation. The enlightenment. How to partake of this inheritance. Because it belongs to you. So it says we're to partake of it in light. Now, we looked at several things on last week. And we looked at where it says that, number one, that, that we're, we're going to have to be renewed in the spirit of our, in, in our, of our minds. There is, matter of fact, turn to Romans chapter 12. We, we, we see this scripture a lot. We talk about the scripture a lot. But this scripture is so important to a born again believer. To an unsaved person, the message would be get saved. You don't need to talk to an unsaved person about nothing else other than get saved. What Jesus done for you to provide a way out. Get saved. But once you get saved... The message should always be Romans chapter 12, verse 2. This is what we should always be doing. And this is where the body of Christ has particularly failed. Because you get saved and you get excited about salvation. I'm not going to hell. All right, great. But if translated means to change my condition, then not only should I not be going to hell, I shouldn't be living like hell while I'm still here. Hell should still be showing up in my life while I'm still here. If my condition is supposed to change. And I'm telling you today, it's supposed to change. Now, it doesn't change automatically because it requires your faith. Now, notice what it says here. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Be not conformed to this world. Stop copying the behavior patterns of the world. Stop acting. You're going to have to stop acting like you acted before you got saved is what he's saying. Amen. Now, how do you do that? And be transformed. There has to be a transformation take place in your thinking. Your mind. God's people get saved and they don't renew their mind. And when your mind is not renewed, you can only continue to do what you have learned to do. You have no other information to operate off of. So if you if now, even though you're born again, if you continue to operate with the same information, then that says that whatever your condition is right now will remain the same because you're going to continue to do what you've always been doing. Nothing's changed, but it says you're going to, have to be renewed by the by, be transformed by the renewing the entire renewing of your mind. Why? So that you can prove for yourself what God's good and acceptable and perfect will is. How are you going to find out what the will of God is? You're going to have to get light, revelation on the issue. And to the degree 
a revelation you receive will determine the level of condition you live in throughout your life. Now, God has called you and I to the top. And the blessing's job is to take you there. But it moves you by degrees, depending on the revelation that you will learn and operate in. The more knowledge you get about God and the things of God, the stronger you get in the operation of the kingdom of God, the system, the, the better off your life begins to look. Now, so, so there's a renewing that's going to have to take place. Now, what are we renewing to? Let's go back. Let's, now, I do want to look at this again. Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. <clears throat> Verse 14. Now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the good, the gospel of the kingdom of God. Now, I told you the kingdom of God is a system of operation that causes heaven to show up in the earth. Well, Jesus came preaching the blessing that causes this system to work. That's what he was doing here. Then he went on, he said here, verse 15, saying, the time is fulfilled, or the time is at hand. Or you can put it this way, I have shown up now. Or the system has shown up now. So the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus is making it clear here. Hey, it's time now for you to switch systems of operation. That's what he's saying here. You've been operating on one, the inferior system. And now the superior system, the kingdom of God is at hand. How are you going to get in on it? Repent. To repent means to what? Have a change of mind. How are you going to change your mind? You've got to get it renewed with other information. Repent doesn't mean, oh Lord, I'm sorry, I repent. That doesn't mean you repent. That's not repent. But most people think the word repent means I'm sorry. The word repent, when there's true repentance, you don't do it anymore. Because your mind on that issue has changed. That's why you call folks up and they tell people talk about, well, you know, just repent. It's going, everything's going to be all right. No, it ain't. If you don't change your mind, it's going to be the exact same way it was yesterday like it is today. Nothing changing because you, you, you ain't changed. Repent means change your mind. He says repent. Change your mind. Change your mind. Do what? And believe the gospel. Re repent, change your mind, come back up to the top in your thinking. Well, what will be the top in my thinking? Believe in the gospel. Well, what's the gospel? We looked at that on last week. He says the gospel to Abraham was preached by God saying in thee all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. So the gospel message is the blessing has returned. So repent, change your thinking, come back up and start believing the blessing. That is the good news of the kingdom of God. There's a new system in town, and this system now is the blessed system, and it's the top system. Amen. That's what he says here. So that's what we're supposed to be renewing our minds to, the gospel. I am blessed. I don't care how I feel. I don't care what I think. I am blessed, and I'm going to keep confessing and reading and believing it until I have completely renewed my mind to the fact that I have to succeed. There is no way for me not to succeed. I expect to go to the top. Well, I'm blessed. Yeah. I expect it to work. Yeah. Now, I don't know how long it's going to take, but glory to God, there's some scriptures in the Bible where they, they start, they talks about doing things speedily. So how about we find those who are saying, well, glory to God, I believe for some speedily victories. All right, so you're going to have to repent if you're going to partake of the inheritance of the saints. You're going to need light, revelation, and the only way that you're going to get the revelation is you're going to have to change systems of thinking. Now God changed systems spiritually for you, 
when you got born again. But you're going to have to do something with the other systems of thinking and acting. That's that. Now, you're going to have to do something with that. Now, well, Pastor, I, I, I do believe. All right, good. Thank you. Appreciate that. But let me tell you now, believing is only the start. Because there's a scripture that says the devil believes too and trembles. So if all you're doing is believing, you still kind of, <laughs> you know, you, you, you're, on a, you're, on a, you're on path, but you haven't gotten much higher than Satan yet because he believes too. So what is it that we need to do to get on up to where we need to be? Well, look at John chapter 8. Yes, you're going to have to believe it. That's the start of your faith. Believing is where faith starts. But believing is not the sum total of faith. Faith has some action to it as well. But notice, verse 31, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. I could easily say this morning, Then said Jesus to the members of Works of Faith Ministries that believed him. So they believe, just like you believe. I, I, I honestly think, and I'm convinced that you believe that God is right. I'm, I'm I, I do. I, I'm convinced that you know that this. Hey, if God said it, it's, I, we believe. I know you believe it. But why isn't it happening? Keep reading. This is what Jesus said to those that would believe. If you continue. In my word, then are you my disciples indeed. In other words, if you will continue to stand and act on what you said you believed. See, believing is where it starts, but you got to continue until what you believe moves you to action. See, you don't go to action and then believe something. No, you believe something that will move you into an action. So Jesus says, hey, if you will continue in what you said you believe, then you become a disciple. The word disciple comes from a word discipline. In other words, the word that you that you really believe and stand on will cause you to discipline yourself in that area. It'll change how you think in that area. That's what discipline does. Isn't that why we do discipline? To change a, 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 a believing? Uh, you don't believe that mama whoop your butt? Okay, here, let me give you some discipline. Now you believe me next time, won't you? Yeah. Same thing is true. You, you, you don't believe that, that working out in the gym uh, will, will help you lose weight, but when you discipline yourself and you go and you find out they work, now you, you believe, hey, you, it moves you to an action, right? Discipline. Discipline, it shows up to what? To change uh, thinking that changes behavior. And then Jesus says here, and if you'll continue this process, you'll know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. Now, get it. What he's saying here. You said you believe something. Great. But you're going to have to continue on in that thing. You have to meditate it. You're going to have to confess it. You're going to have to stand on it. You're going to have to act on it. And as you do it, your life becomes more and more disciplined by it. And the greater the truth of that grows in you, it will make you free. It didn't say set you free. Here's the difference. If I take this and I set this here, I did all the work. Didn't involve you at all. Didn't involve that book doing anything. I did all the work, right? That's what would happen if God did everything for you. He set a new spirit in you. He did that. But in order for you to renew your mind, you're going to have to let the, 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 the truth of the word that you believe uh, uh, make you free. The word make is a process that you're involved in. See, to make a cake means I'm going to have to gather this stuff, mix this stuff. Put the stuff and put it in the oven. I got some parts to it and pieces to it. Well, making is a process. 
Renewing your mind isn't a one-time shot that happens overnight. It is a process. It is a continual process that goes on. And as you continue in the process, the process will eventually bring you to a place of enlightenment. And where you have God's revelation now, that's when freedom shows up. Now, it may not be, you may not look free in the natural. It never looks free in the natural first. Freedom always starts in the mind. I see it first. Because if I can see it, I can go to wherever I can see. If you can't see it, you can't go there. This is why Martin Luther King was able to stand up and say some of the stuff that he said. He got in the word of God and meditated. Some of the speeches he gives, you go back and look at the word. They came out of the word. But God had got the man to a place where he was able to see something that no one else could see. How do you know? He told you. He says, I've already been to the mountaintop and I've seen. Now, what, did, what, what mountain did he go to in the natural? He wasn't talking about a natural mountain. God had raised him up in faith to a place to where he could see the day to where uh, these, the, the things that he was fighting for and struggling for what was coming to pass. Before we got there. So this is what Jesus is saying. It'll make you free. In that man's mind, he was already free. That's why he was able to fight for what he was fighting for. Because a personal press is not going to fight like that because they don't see how. Now, I know this is going to be controversial. And I know it's going out on YouTube, but I'm going to say it anyway. That was the difference between him and Malcolm X. Malcolm X want to fight for everything. When I got to fight for everything, that means I'm fighting because I don't see myself free yet. Because I got to fight my way out of here. King said, we ain't got to fight. Why? <laughs> We've already, hey, we're free. Free man don't have to fight. It's no struggle. I know, uh, whatever. But anyway, you just take it however you want to take it. But that's the truth on the matter. Now, so that's what Jesus says. You're going to have to, you're going to have to continue in this thing long enough until it has disciplined you to stand, believe, and act on the revelation of God to become that partaker of what already is available for you. See, it's already there. And if it's already there, I just need to know how to get my hands on it. I'm not fighting to get it. It's already there for me. I don't have to fight the devil to get it. I don't have to fight people to get it. No, this ain't got nothing to do with people or the devil. This got something to do between me and God and my Lord and Savior. I can have whatever I'm big enough to believe for. All right. Now, well, what happens if you don't do, if you don't believe, if you won't follow that process and renew your mind? Now, I'm, I'm going to show you something this morning because you need to understand this. I don't care. I don't care that you saved. The devil don't care that you saved. That's not. See, getting born again is the starting point. Yes, that needed to happen in everyone's life. But you got to move on from there. That's why Paul said you got to move on from the elementary teachings and the, uh, of, of the, the basic doctrines of Christ. You got to move on from there. So what happens if you get saved and you don't move? Because you won't believe nothing. You won't meditate on anything. Well, go back over. Let's look at verse 23. Now I'm going to read this from the Amplified Bible. We're still in John chapter 8. Then Jesus said, you are from below, I'm from above. You are of the world, of the earthly order, and I am not of the world. Verse 24, this is why I told you that you will die in and under, under, under your sin, sins rather. For if you do not believe that I am he whom I claim to be, if you do not adhere to trust in and rely on me, you will die in your sins. Now, what is he talking about? Is, is that, that, that the devil going to kill you? No, that's not what he's talking about there. What he's saying is this. If you won't believe the word, then you will live your life and die 
in the same condition that you started in. That's what he said. Although you've been translated out of that kingdom over to the kingdom of his son, if you don't get your mind renewed to what you've been translated into, if you don't get the revelation on how to begin walking in the new condition, you will live and die just like you started when you, at, from the beginning of your salvation, wherever you were. Nothing will ever change. It ain't about you. The devil going to kill you. No, the devil can't kill you. That's been taken away from him. He hasn't had that authority anymore. But you'll stay stuck right where you are. You won't, you, you won't advance any. You won't, your condition will look the exact same way it looked before you got saved. And you have been in church for 20, 30, 40 years. And you will look the exact same way in 40 years that you looked day one. And that's tragic. And it won't be God's fault. But the devil convinces people like that, that something's wrong with God and this doesn't work. And then they, most of them turn and walk away. And stop trusting him who they ought to trust and obey. Because they refuse to renew their minds. They blamed it on God or Satan convinced them that it was God's fault. When they're the ones who wouldn't believe anything. This is why we keep staying on you guys about taking this word and eating on it and meditating on it and believing it and believing it and believing it and walking and staying and continuing. I don't care how you feel about it. You can't give up and throw it away. You got to stick with it. I don't care if you get to the place to where you just exhausted all you want. Oh, and I ain't looked at the word of God in weeks. When you come to your senses, get it back out and go again. That's right. That's right. You don't ever quit. You don't ever stop. There is a kingdom inheritance that belongs to you. And Jesus said, fight the good fight of faith and you will lay hold on it. It's yours. It doesn't belong to the devil. But he'll keep it bottled up as long as you let him bottle it up. But if you continue to stand and make demands and, uh, out of your faith and put demands on the word to produce in your life, it has to come to pass. It's your stuff. Now, <clears throat> Look at Ephesians chapter 1. God never intended on you having to do this by yourself. Even the renewing of your mind process isn't all on you. You got help. Let's start here at verse 11. In whom talking about in Christ. Also, we have obtained an inheritance. What does the word obtain mean? That means you've already received something. So you've already received an inheritance. Being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. God has a plan and a purpose for you. And the inheritance was given so that you could accomplish his plan and purposes in your life. Neither one of us, none of us in here can get anything that God asks us to get done, done without his help. Without this blessing, this inheritance. It's impossible. Because whatever God has asked you to do is bigger than where you are right now. And it's bigger than you. You're going to need some light to get, it in, to, get it, to get it done. So it says you've re already received something. And whatever this inheritance, it has everything to do with the knowledge of his will. It's, it's according to his will and his purposes. Now notice verse 13. In whom you also trusted. After that, you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Now, notice 
in whom you also trusted. That's Jesus. So it's talking about after you got born again, you got, well, you got born again by believing the word of truth, which produced salvation. In whom after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit of promise. So now when you got born again, how did that happen? You heard the word and believed it and received it and salvation took place. Now, when we use the word salvation, what actually happened is the initial evidence of your salvation took place, which was getting born again. You're saved now. But salvation just doesn't mean God saved. Salvation means complete, total deliverance of everything. Spirit, soul, body, and everything that has to do with it. Salvation means being translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Translate, I mean, uh, salvation means every facet of your life now has to change and be reconformed to the new nature and the new condition. Are you following me? Y'all just kind of sitting there. Are oh, 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 y'all getting it? But then he goes on, he says here, after all of that, you were sealed with the Holy Ghost of promise. Why? Because he didn't expect you to get this done on your own. Now, why were you sealed with the Holy Ghost of promise? Well, in the Amplified Bible, it tells you. It says that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is the first fruit, the pledge, the foretaste. He is the guarantor on you acquiring complete and total possession of what you've inherited. Wow. His job in your life and in my life is to cause us to acquire complete possession of it. In other words, he's been sent to help you partake. If you are ready. He's always working in our lives to get us to partake. Now, God has done his job. He declared a blessing. He set the blessing out there and made it available. Well, when did he do that? Genesis chapter one. When he, blessed Ab when he blessed Adam, he blessed humanity. He put the blessing there for all men and all me mankind. Doesn't change. Adam lost it. Jesus came back and re-secured it. God set it out there and made it available. Jesus acquired it for you. Now, and, and, and made it available. The Holy Spirit's job now is to help you obtain it. So we're living in the day now of the Holy Spirit who is sent to help you get your condition outwardly to match the condition inwardly that's going on in your life. And he knows he has to give, help you gain revelation. See, you think the Holy Spirit's going to go out there and do it for you. No, 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 no. The Holy Spirit's job is to help you get revelation. So that your faith and the blessing can go out there and do it for you. Or empower you to do it, in other words. Let's look at this. Now, now look at John chapter 14. We're building some stuff here. Now, in John 14, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. This is Jesus talking here. And I'll pray the Father. And he should give you another comforter that he may abide with you, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him for he dwells with you and shall be in you. And I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you yet in a little while. The world will see me no more, but you'll see me because I live. You shall also live. Now, notice what Jesus just said here. Jesus says, I'm going to ask the father to give you another comforter 
Now, for him to say the word another means it's going to be something of the same kind. So Jesus had been walking with these men and he had been doing every, providing everything for them. The blessing was walking with them and Jesus, the word was walking with them and everything they needed, Jesus was, it was, Jesus was his faith was provided for him, right? Now Jesus is getting ready to go away at, at, at some point. He says, now I'm going to ask the father and he's going to give you another comforter. So that means whoever is coming that he's asking for is going to be able to do the exact same thing that Jesus had been doing. Amen. Now, a comforter's job is to do what? Make you comfortable. And Jesus went on and says, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. Yeah. In other words, the comforter is going to come. And he's going to live in you. I want you to follow this. So we have Jesus. We have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, the Comforter, on the inside of us right now. You have the Comforter, not a, a Comforter. You have the Comforter in you right now. And the job of the Comforter is to make your life comfortable. But if he is in you, then why is it that we're not living to the level of comfort yet? Because there is more information that he needs to make available that you need to get so that you can renew your mind so that you can act on. Amen. But he's there. So you have a comforter. Verse 26, but the comforter which is the Holy Ghost whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things. What is the job of the comforter? He's not there to do it for you. He's there to teach you how to do it. The Holy Ghost wasn't sent to do your work for you. He was sent to teach you how to work in the spirit and get things done. So you need to be listening to him. He's always talking. He's always giving information. He's always warning. He's always instructing because that's his job to make sure that you get your hands on what belongs to. He's the guarantee. That's what I read. Did, I, did we read that in, in, in over in Ephesians? He's the guarantee. Well, how can he guarantee it? Because he knows how to do it. If you will listen and follow the comforter, it is guaranteed for you to, for your condition to change. Amen. Your condition cannot remain the same when you're following the comforter. Can't. You have to increase. You have to get better. You have to start rising to the top. There's no other way for it to work when you're following the comforter whose job is to teach you all things. And who knows the will of God. All right. So he's teaching you. He's training you. He's educating you. He's providing the revelation, the light. So that, that you are able to partake. Now, look at 2 Corinthians. Chapter 2. And, and notice this. Where am I at? Where is it? Oh, okay, here we go. So, verse 20. Well, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. For all the promises of God in him are yea and amen in him. Unto the glory of God by us. Now he, talking about God, which establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, 
who has also sealed us and given the earnest of his spirit in our hearts. So once again, we see that the spirit of God is there to help you be established to get in on all the promises that are here and amen. God has already made the promises, already said amen, so be it. That's the way that they are. They're always yes. Now you need to know how to let the Holy Ghost establish you because he's in there to get in on everything that's been already said yes to. See, you ain't got to ask God, is this for me? Or oh, Lord, you know, if it be your will. You get in the word and find it, it's already been, yes. It's already been approved. I'm not waiting to find out. If it's in the book, it's already been approved. I don't have to ask God, is healing your will for me? It's already been approved. I don't have to ask God if I'm supposed to have some money. It's already been approved. Your house has been approved. Your car has been approved. If you want a husband, that's been approved. If you want a wife, that's been approved. If you want kids, that's been approved. Well, Pastor, you just say, I want kids. But see, what you don't realize is, you know, the doctor says I can't have any. Well, there are plenty of stories in the Bible uh, that, 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 that we read one this morning where they were said you can't have any kids. But God's word says you've been approved and they had one anyway. And if you want more than one, you have a whole family of them. Now, I, I, I probably wouldn't be able to, I, I wouldn't believe that. But you got some people that want a whole bunch of kids. That's all right. Believe for them. And then, believe, hey, you believe God for the inheritance to go with to take care of them. You want a form? Believe God for the form, and all y'all move on out there. <laughs> but that ain't me. But anyway, so, 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 so we see that. Now look at 1 Corinthians chapter chapter uh, 1. Well, chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now, now, now watch this. Well, hmm. what do we want to do here? We'll come back there. Go to Romans chapter 8 first. I think it, it'd be better if we go this way. Romans chapter 8. Now notice what this says here in verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So are you being led by the Spirit of God? You should, it says you're the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. All right? And whereby we say we have a daddy who is our father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirits that we really are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be, if, 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 if uh, so be that we suffer with him, we shall also be glorified together. So now notice what it just said there. The Holy Spirit, part of his job is to do his, well, his job is to what? Provide you with light. Well, what's the initial light that you saved? You really are his child now. And once you really begin to believe that I'm really God's child, oh, I'm an heir. Because I can't be a child without being an heir. So the Holy Spirit, is, he's always working to prove to you that you are the child and you are an heir. And if you're an heir, that means you're the heir of what? Of an inheritance. And not just any kind of heir, but a joint heir with Christ. You get the same level of inheritance that Jesus gets. This is what the Spirit of God is trying to alert you to, is that you, your condition in life should mirror what Jesus looks like right now in heaven. That's the kingdom of God, thy will be done. He says, he says, uh, 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 that, 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 how, how does the scripture go? Um, oh, God, it just, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done in earth. 
just like it is in heaven. That's the kingdom of God to make sure that there is a breeze from heaven into your life so that your condition starts to look like you're already there now. That's the inheritance. That's the job of the blessing. And the Holy Ghost is here to let you know and to show you that. Now, how does he do it? Now, look at 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 1. No, chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And look at, let's start with verse 9. Now, it says, verse 9, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of men or into the, see, let's, let's, let's break this down. When he's talking about the eye, he's talking about the natural eye. Remember the example I gave this morning during offering. The natural eye can't see this. The natural ear hasn't heard this. Neither has it entered into the heart. That's talking about the natural consciousness of man. The things that God has prepared. The Amplified Bible says the things that God has prepared and keeps ready. The things that God has prepared, made, and keeps ready for those who promptly obey him and gratefully recognizes his benefits that he's bestowed. Huh. So there are some Things that God has made and keeps ready for you that your natural eye can see, that your natural ear has not heard of, and it's not in the natural consciousness of men. Well, if, and, and most people preach that and hoop and holler and stop. Well, if we stop there, you still stuck because you can't see it, you can't hear it, and you don't know how to think about it. Yeah. You need the next verse. But he has revealed them to us by his spirit. The Holy, jobs, the Holy Ghost's job is to help your spiritual eyes see what your natural eye can't, cause your spiritual ears to hear what your natural ears can't hear, and, because, and, and to help renew your mind, your conscious mind, to what has truly went on in your spirit. He's revealing this to you if you are letting. But they've been revealed to us by, by, by the Spirit. Then he goes on, he says here, For the Spirit searches all, all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man know the things of a man save the Spirit which is in him? Even so, the things of God no man knows but the Spirit of God. We have not, I mean, we have received not the Spirit of, uh, of the world, Notice you have not gone back to the same junk in the world, but the spirit which comes from God, that we might know the things that are freely given us of, uh, to know of God. In other words, the spirit of God didn't come to teach you on how to use natural wisdom better. He didn't come to help you get smarter in the world. This is why it doesn't make any difference whether you have a Ph.D. or not. You can still do what God told you to do and you never graduated from anything. But that doesn't matter because it wasn't based on natural wisdom. It was based on what the Holy Ghost was teaching me. And if I follow him, he knows all things. See, you can do what a person with a Ph.D. can't do. See, they thought that, that, that uh, uh, Carver, George Washington Carver, Carver, the peanut man, Carver, yeah. They thought he was dumb, ignorant and stupid because he was black. Black folks don't know nothing, especially back then. They wouldn't give him any money. They wouldn't have him get in no school. They wouldn't let him do nothing. So the man went out there, got a born, and, 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 created all kind of stuff out of, a, out of a peanut, soybean, all this kind of stuff, did so much to Congress invited him up to say, man, how in the world are you getting all this done? Uh, uh, they, were, they were telling me that, that uh, uh, I think it was the guy that either on Ford, no, 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 Firestone, the tire man, was trying to get him to come work for him because he figured out how to do to get the rubber how to make rubber out of a plant. He said, I ain't coming up there. Now, how did this man do all of that? He told him, 
I get it from the Bible. I take my Bible, I go into my into his where he went, shut the door, and he talks to God based on his faith in the word, and God reveals to him. I don't need a PhD when I got God doing the revelation. What do you need a PhD for? A PhD is still stupid in the eyes of God. Because the Bible says that the world's wisdom is foolishness compared to what he know. So now, no, no, and so he goes on, he says here, we have not received the, the spirit of the world, but the spirit of God, that we may know the things that are freely given us to know, which things we also speak. Not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. But the natural, mind, the natural man receiveth not the things of God, the Spirit of God, rather, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. In other words, they have to be revealed to you by the Spirit. They don't come from a book. They don't come from because you went to school. They come because you will stand in faith and believe God. Now, we're going to close with Galatians chapter 4. Now, I want you to read, read this. I mean, listen to this. Galatians chapter 4. Now, remember, above he's called you, and if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed, and you're heirs according to what was promised to Jesus, the inheritance, all right? Verse 1 of chapter 4 starts. Now, I'm going to read this from my message Bible. He says, let me show you the implications of this. As long as the heir is a minor, he, is, he has no advantage over the slave. Now, let's stop for a second here. The word minor simply means unrenewed, untrained, unlearned immature. Well, what's the slave issue? If you go over and read in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, it tells you, it says that, talks about our previous conditions, it says we were all following and under the control of the demon spirit that still works in the children of disobedience. So, what he's talking about here as slave is saying, that as long as you stay unrenewed, now that you're born again, if you continue to stay childish in your thinking, unrenewed in your thinking, you are no different than what you, you are going to live no differently than you lived before you got saved. That's the slave, the unsaved. So, as long as the heir is a minor, he has no advantage. Look, you have no advantage over the unsaved. Though legally, he owns the entire inheritance. He is subject to tutors and administrators until the date the father has set for the emancipation. Where who are the tutors and administrators? Those were the demons and devils it says that we all followed and were under the sway and tendency of those demons and devils and, and the spirit of disobedience that, it, it, read it, it tells you. So the tutors and the and administrators here, whatever they told you to do, whatever they pressured you to do, you did it before you got saved. You want your own boss? And when you're not renewed in your thinking, even though you're saved, they're still running your life. Even though you're saved. If you're a minor, it says they continue to do it until the time set for the emancipation. Well, what was the time set for the emancipation? He, it was, what is emancipation? Freedom. Well, let's keep reading. This is the way it is, it is with us. When we were minors, unmature, childish, we were just like slaves ordered around by simple instructions from the tutors and administrators of this world with no say in the conduct of our lives. But when the time arrived that was set by God, God sent his son born among us uh, of a woman, born under the conditions of the law so that we might 
re, so that he might redeem those of us who have been kidnapped by the law. Now, uh, thus we have been set free to experience to experience our rightful heritage. So now what was the time set forth for your emancipation? It was a time set forth that God pre-planned before the foundation of the world that was the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That day was already set in the spirit of God. God said it. And that was the day emancipation showed up for everybody. But you're going to have to receive and believe it. And if you don't renew your mind to it, you stay a minor. If you stay a minor, you still stay underneath the control of demonic influences. Which means your condition doesn't change even though you have a right to everything that God has provided. I mean, are y'all hearing this? Uh, <clears throat> Verse 6 here says, you can tell for sure that we are now fully adopted as his own children because God sent, his, sent the spirit of his son in our hearts, crying, Papa, Father. Doesn't that privilege and intimate conversation with God make it plain that you are not a slave, but a child? And if you are a child, you are also an heir with complete access to the inheritance. Complete access to the inheritance. So, if you don't, back to the scripture we started out with. Giving thanks unto the Father who has made you able to partake of the inheritance of the saints. How? In light. If you don't allow the Holy Spirit to do his job in your life and cause your mind to be renewed and cause your thinking to change, your condition will remain the same. Although you come to church every single week. And there won't be anything that God can do about it because you allowed it. I don't know about you, but I don't want the devil still run the affairs of my life when the Bible says I've been delivered from his authority. I don't want the devil still showing up in my life doing what he wants to do because I don't know how to shut my mouth and stopping, and I keep opening my mouth, giving him permission, and he's running my mouth because I won't allow God, through the Spirit of God, to renew my mind, and I keep listening to him, the devil. I'm not going to do that. Your condition right now, all of us in this room, whether you want to agree with me or not, your condition right now is the sum total of the amount of revelation of God's word you have right now. And if you keep thinking small, you'll keep living small. You keep thinking defeated, you'll keep living defeated. But if you start thinking victorious, you'll start living victorious. If you start thinking big, you'll start living big. Because the spirit of God who lives on the inside of you's job is to do what? Guarantee that you, that your outward conditions change to match your inward conditions but it's based on your willingness to yield and let him do his job. Amen? All right. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. It's simple, it's right, and it's true. We give you praise for it this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.